Okay. I decided I would speak to you from here because uh, in a former life I was a student of theology and standing in front of this always reminds me of the church. <laughs> Uh, in addition to the sound of this beautiful room, I mean the room is nice but the sound is difficult. So in any case, um, I used to be a professional musician for 15 years uh, and a producer and as I said yesterday I, I became a futurist by accident, uh, essentially uh, by writing a book called The Future of Music about the music business uh, in 2004. Uh, people started calling me and said, you are a futurist, can you tell us about the future? I had no idea what that was, but here I am, 12 years later. So I'm going to talk to you today about new technologies, and if you have observed the media in the last couple of days, there's a distinct question that comes up about technology, and the question I have marked in red here, is this technology actually in service of people and planet? <laughs> Uh, that's one of the key questions we'll discuss later. But uh, let's start here. My company, the Features Agency, we have a simple motto, and this, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. So we help our clients anticipate the future. We have over 100 clients worldwide, including big companies like Sony and the BBC and Google and others. Um, so I'll start with this. I think first we can safely say that uh, I call this the, uh, the digital default. You know, we're entering a world where everything is digital. Our music, our movies, our health records, uh, our telephone calls, <laughs> everything is digital and that can be very interesting for a lot of reasons but also very scary at the same time. But if we're looking at this graph here, a population of 8 billion roughly in 2020, 65% of them will be connected to the internet. And that is changing our world very rapidly. It's changing the world of knowledge, of information, of politics. Now, there is, there's not a single politician that is not connected to social networks today. Uh, of course, there are a few left, which I'll talk about in a second, but we can safely say digital default is here. We have a, a huge thing that's happening now with disruptive technologies that you may have experienced. Here's a short list from McKinsey. You can download this, just look for the McKinsey uh, International Disruptive Report. Uh, things like the mobile internet, the automation of knowledge work. This should be quite scary for some of you, uh, considering that we do knowledge work. <laughs> The Internet of Things, the cloud computing and 3D printing, you're aware of all of these trends, so I won't get into it. But McKinsey is saying, roughly, if you count all these together, we'll talk about a new economy that's unfolding that's over $25 trillion in terms of value, what's happening there. So basically, with technology, there's lots of things happening. This is a scary slide, talk about the automation of knowledge work. And so what they're saying, basically, there could be a, a, about 110 million workers are replaced by technology based on smart technology that does the research work, which is kind of an interesting discussion, we should get into this. But um, So, you've seen this, you know, the inauguration of the Pope, the last one, 2005, the previous one, when people were greeting him and underneath that, you know, full of mobile phones. Uh, the next Pope, we will not be seeing any mobile phones because mobile will be implanted in our heads. Allegedly. So it could be something like this, holographics, Google Glass, augmented reality. Let me remind you of this, you know, I'm a musician, I'm not a tech person. You don't have to be a geek to understand what this means. You know, this, these things aren't geek instruments. It's like car navigation. When it first came 15 years ago, car navigation was only for experts. And it took up the whole passenger seat. Now car navigation is for my mother. She's 75 years old. She can operate car navigation. So technology is really mind-boggling quick. You know, we're on an exponential curve of technology development. So our world is moving one, two, three, four, five. It's moving one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and so on. Yeah, we're at four. So the next step is eight, not five. Okay. This is a scary thing about technology, and I think something we have to look at. In the digital society, we're reaching inflection points. You can see that here. Uh, two of them being about basically what they call a digital society in, this, in a sustainable world. And basically what we're heading into is we call this the network society. It's viral, it's exponential, it's noisy, and it's inevitable. 
This is uh, an interesting discussion we should have later, what that means in light of the recent security and, and privacy debate that has uh, raged with Snowden and the NSA. But basically what we're seeing here is that we are now in the position of nuclear power. You know, we have in our hands more information than the President of the United States 15 years ago we have in our mobile phones. So we can do a lot of damage with this. I mean, basically what we're seeing is that we're at the level of infants in terms of ethics, but in technology, we're adults. And these issues will be a major issue for the next 10 years. Um, President Obama, yes, we scan. Basically what's happening here is that, you know, with this increased power, just like nuclear energy, comes very much increased responsibility. And we haven't, we haven't worked this out yet. If you think this through, what happened in the last two weeks with the data scandal that we're seeing in the UK and the US and other countries as well, basically the government scanning every single citizen under the pretense of protection of terrorism, uh, this is a scary proposition. The books of George Orwell have in the last four weeks the sales have quadrupled. Not surprisingly, because people feel like they're in an Orwellian society. Look at this slide of Americans. Of course, any Americans here? <laughs> okay. okay, different world over there, according to the slide at least. The majority of Americans support the prosecution of the whistleblower who is telling us about what happened. So, I call this aberrations in the digital default because we're living in a digital world and it's basically inevitable. But what's happening here is really quite scary that most Americans think that he should indeed be prosecuted. I don't know what your thoughts are on this. And of course, this is just an average American, <laughs> whatever that means. But it's an interesting debate we should have later. In Turkey, four weeks ago, the Prime Minister, I was, I was scheduled to speak in Turkey, was cancelled. Um, the Prime Minister said, Erdogan said, that social media is the worst menace to society. So he's roughly talking about two billion people that use social media, uh, in, in addition to being a menace to society. I think what we're seeing right now is because of technology, this kind of idea of big corporations, big countries, big politicians is reverting to this kind of idea, to where the masses actually are getting empowered, and, and that's what you see in Turkey right now. This is a trend that we're going to see in the future. Um, we discussed briefly about capitalism yesterday, I'll get back to that in a second. But this obviously relates to our business model. And uh, my new book that I'm working on is called From Eco to Eco, and its main topic is the sustainable capitalism, uh, if that even exists. That sounds like an oxymoron already. But anyway, the domes of protection are cracking. And we're seeing this in many different ways. First, of course, with media, with businesses, organizations, with states, brands, and leaders. That this idea of living under a protected world, like we do in Switzerland, you know, with the banking secrets, for example. You cannot sustain that in a connected world. You can't live under a protected dome. Whether you're a record label, or Switzerland, or, or Turkey. Okay. So we're seeing this as a, as a global symptom, as a, as a consequence of technology. We're seeing a new generation of people, not the millennials, but the ones after it. I call this the generation re. That is the generation that is reconsidering, relearning, recycling, refusing, rethinking. And that's obviously not us, most of us, you know, we're a little bit above that, but it's the kids between, say, 20 and 35. Some of you still qualify for that. <laughs> So this is a big change in terms of how they use technology, and they're the ones who are driving the economy. They're the ones who are questioning attention monopolies like television and using the internet instead. You know, most kids that now have their own households, they don't get satellite or pay TV, they use the internet. They are no longer in the same uh, speed of things that we are. Now, in terms of ecology, this is really changing how ecology works. For example, the idea of using machine-to-machine -machine intelligence to improve efficiency for, her, for agricultural. It has been worked out that basically if we use technology to further how we plant and how we water, we could save 40% of resources. So the switch to renewable energy plus the switch to smart technologies, sensor networks and so on, could basically solve the problem. So technology, in my view, again, I'm not a technologist, it needs to drive an other kind of growth. An 
the other kind of growth means not growth and profits at all costs, but a different kind of growth. The CEO of Unilever says in order to live within the natural limits of the planet, we have to decouple growth from the environmental impact. And I think this is going to be the mission for the next 20 years and other kind of growth. It has been called by John Elkerton, you're probably aware of this, the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. And I think this is one of the key topics when it's about technology is to figure out how that actually all goes together. So I think we're in this position, we're now in a jumping into a different fishbowl. And as futurists, this is going to be a real challenge. Because this fishbowl basically means that all of those kids that are connected on the internet, they are the next billion futurists. In the true sense of a word, they are actually doing part of our work now, at this very moment. And this means transformation for us. You know, here's a good image about transformation. You may know the game where you can make a robot out of a car and vice versa. <coughs> That's going to be our future, to quickly morph into a different shape. Could be quite a challenge. So, I think in general our world is moving from empires, as we've seen, you know, Microsoft, big countries, big states, big banks, big insurances, to networks. It's a great movie, you can watch about this, called Connected by Tiffany Schlein, where she talks about how everything is becoming interdependent. As you can see right now, you know, Turkey's position as possibly entering the U European Union is significantly threatened by Erdogan's response to uh, the wishes of, of people about his park. So it's a major issue. We're heading towards uh, ecosystems, not empires. And this is a big societal change you know, for money, for financial institutions, for everything. The Internet of Things, you heard about this, you know, the connectivity of devices, sensor networks, connected networks, and so on. But here's a key point. We should not be in a position like this to where we say, you know, we have technology that will basically solve all of our problems. I lived in California for 14 years, and that's kind of the, the view of things in California, is that if something goes wrong, you just invent something to change it. And it's called the techno-fix mentality. And while I really understand how this works, and the likes of Ray Kurzweil are, of course, right on top of that movement, I really believe that technology alone is not sufficient in terms of solving our global issues. Technology is a crucial part of this, but will not solve the problem by itself. For example, if you think that we can engineer the environment, because we have basically uh, uh, killed our atmosphere already, so we're going to engineer it with technology and control it, and I think we're a little bit ahead of ourselves there. So technology alone is not the answer. I think it's the storytelling that makes us human. Computers don't tell stories, and I mean they tell stories in another way, <laughs> but not in a human way. And this is very important for us as futurists. We have to tell stories about the future. Looking at this scary slide, which I came up with myself, that's why it's extra scary. The green line shows you the decline of, of regular human jobs, whether it's checkout clerks or financial analysts basically jobs that robots and software can do. And this will be a decline of up to 80 or 90 percent in the next 20 years. A lot of our jobs will evaporate because of this. You know, if you're, if you're a grocery checkout clerk, you can get an our radio frequency chip to do that work. And that's already in there. So basically what we're going to see is that technology brings us back to what really matters, which is truly human jobs. And that's the other line here, the, the uh, slightly blue line that are currently being developed. And I believe our job is a truly human job because it requires, hopefully, <laughs> some creativity. Uh, so, we are drowning in information. You know, if you're on Twitter or Facebook, you know what I'm talking about. We're literally drowning in information. But we're starved for knowledge. And this is an important point. What we need really is uh, wisdom, learnings, relevant, relevance, and, and depth, not more noise. Great slide here from a, a French philosopher, I forgot his name, but he says, logic proves, intuition discovers. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, do we want to live in a world that is run by logic? Then we live in a world of machines. In many ways, you could argue we're heading that way, especially considering the NSA 
than others. Creating an algorithm that puts you into the no-fly zone and there's nothing you can do about it. So I think intuition discovers we're moving into a world of ecosystems. And I didn't come up with this picture, actually I found this when I was looking for my topic <laughs> on Tumblr. But it's a, it's a good picture. We're moving into a world where it's more like a biosphere. And I don't mean this in the green sense, I mean it's in the organizational sense. And we, we hinted at this several times yesterday. Social local mobile, in America they call this Solomo, which is basically you know the social networks, mobile devices, and so on. Um, that is a huge chance for futurists, and I see many of us not using this enough. I would like to encourage you to take that position. You know, that, uh, if, just take a look on Twitter, uh, what people are doing, a futurist there. Very few of us are actually part of this conversation. That needs to change. I think this is a warp drive for futurists in, in terms of how we can do things. Check out this simple blog that I've been running on Tumblr, which was just purchased by Yahoo. In nine months, this is a blog about the future of business. In nine months, I got 33,420 followers using this platform that essentially takes no time whatsoever to share stuff from my research. And I think we could all do this. You know, this would be very interesting also for the organization. Because finally, we can escape from the tyranny of distribution. If you wanted to have a future show on television, you have to go to the BBC or you know wherever you go to the Discovery Channel and they would say, who the hell are you? Now you can do your own future show on any web-based platform, like YouTube. Why are we not using this? Why are so little of us actually using this platform of distribution? I think it's important. Social networks are the next broadcasters, the next TV stations. But then again, you know, in, in context with the current data issues, you know, you may think about this again. You know, this is kind of an oxymoron in a way, but I'm doing this anyway. Video is the new text. If you're not making videos about what you're saying, it's like not writing. I'm, I'm serious, I'm not making a joke here. In five years, more than 80% of the entire internet traffic will be on video. People watch videos about topics. This is a crucial way of information. We are becoming part of a global brain. And this is very important, I think, for us. And this is already happening here, so I'm quite happy about that. We're moving into the cloud. I touched on this earlier. Education is the best example. You may have noticed that the biggest initiative this year are about digital education, massively online learning communities, so-called MOGs. This is a very, very big trend that will be very helpful to our cause as well. Consider offering a course on a platform called Coursera, which is just now offering the first courses, you know, they're free, of course, for futurism. Check it out, Coursera, like the course in, in the era. In terms of what we do, you know, our, the way that we disseminate our message is really dramatically changing. If you look at this network paradigm picture from the 60s, we're moving in a world that used to be locked. You know, big companies, big universities, big banks, big governments, big writers, now to a world that is interconnected and liquid, fluid. And I think this is something we need to learn. We need to be fluid as part of a larger system not within our own system. And this is, of course, quite difficult. It's not either or. It actually has a combination of those things together. I'm going to come to the end so we can move to the panel. <laughs> OK. So there's a great book you should read if you're in the future business called Glyconomics. I didn't write it, but it's still a good book. Uh, it's from a friend of mine. And it's talking about how liking companies and people is becoming a currency. There's a machine from Pepsi that if you like Pepsi on Facebook, they'll give you a free canned drink. This is just an example of what's happening. Every single bank and organization wants you to like them, mostly on Facebook, but also of somewhere else. And we have to be careful of not this becoming what I call a hedonic treadmill. You know, basically saying, you know, look how great we are every four seconds is probably also not the purpose of social networks. Big data, I'll skip on this, except to say that I think one of the key issues today is that our data is becoming like oil, like really valuable material. 
and this is going to be a major topic for the next 10 years. We're essentially moving from the oil economy to the data economy because of technology. And there again we have uh, NSA inside in most of those. Uh, the Google self-driving car, the switch towards open. If you look at what's happening, for example, in, uh, in mobile phones, you know, the Android system has beat Apple by a long shot because they are an open interactive system. So open is actually, in most ways, beating closed. The end of silos, we can't think of this as being in one particular place anymore. You know, we're now in different places at the same time. I think this is kind of this idea that we are over here and these guys are over there is melting. And that goes for academic versus non-academic as well. So some quick uh, comments on futurism, then I'll wrap up. First, the digital default is here. So we need to embrace this. This is inevitable. But we also need to think about what that means. You know, for our data, for our privacy, for you know, who do we work with, why do we do things. The Faustian bargains that we strike with the like of Facebook and Google. Something to think about. I think we are as futures like artists that aim to expose possibilities for transformation. And that's when the work that I strive for with my clients is I don't want to come to them and say, yeah, I have some, I have some great arguments and spreadsheets why you should be doing X, Y, Z. I'm trying to show them the possibilities of transformation. This is a key part. Logic proves but intuition discovers. I think we need to refocus on creating new ecosystems and not putting band-aids on the old one. This is a tough mission. As uh, Buckminster Fuller said, basically engineering a new system is always preferable when it's about the old system. We need a different kind of growth, sustainable, natural capitalism, a triple bottom line. This is clearly not a plea for socialism, the opposite. Yeah, it's a plea for saying that the current system that we have is topping out. And I think we are somewhat on the same agenda as the discussion of yesterday. So um, I think we should make much better use of the social local mobile technologies because everyone else is. And uh, I did the other day, I checked most of you guys out on the internet. In terms of our input on the discussion that's happening on the social local mobile internet, we are not really part of it. And that needs to change. I think we have a lot more to say than, than, than we say in academic papers. We have global distribution channels available. And here's a scary part. Futuring is becoming a default job. All of those kids that are currently researching stuff online, they think of themselves as futurists. They think of themselves as being in the business of defining the future. So how do we become indispensable? That's my final question to you. This is the key question for our future. What's our future role to make us indispensable from the process of creating our future? Thanks very much.